Hello. Mr. Fred Hirsch, good to see you again. Nice to see you too. How are you? We meet you? in Ghent one more time. Yeah, last time was Antwerp at the Jazz oh, Middleheim Festival. That's right, Jazz Middleheim. The right. beautiful park and the castle. Yes, and yes. A familiar place to you. Yes, I am. I tell people that I've played more concerts in Belgium than any country in Europe. Yeah, you told me last time that you yeah. feel very much at home here. Yes, I don't speak Flemish, um, but uh, uh, my European manager lives in Brussels, so naturally I do lots of concerts in the Benelux countries, and uh, and I and I I really love it. I don't love the weather, but but uh, audience here audiences here are great, and they've gotten to know me over the years uh, quite well. That's also partly because you used to play with Toots Tielemans. Eh? Yes, when I first came, I was playing with Toots. And that was in the mid 80s, so that's a long time ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, we played all over the place. Um, and that was in the days when he was first bringing an American group over to Europe instead of playing with his uh, Belgian band. And so sometimes he was able to bring uh, bring an American group over, and that, that was very nice for him. I think he felt very happy about that, being able to have an international band. And how was it to play with him? Toots was, he was a gentleman, and he played with so much feeling, and um, he was very supportive. Uh, you know, if I was playing a solo, and he would be very, you know, encouraging, and... Um, I think he's one of the great ballad players in jazz history, regardless of the instrument. I think he's one of the all-time great ballad players, just playing a melody. Uh, he had such a unique approach, and part of it is the craziness of the harmonica. He had to work out very ingenious solutions to get around, because it's, you know, he's one of those people that really define their instrument. And you can't say that about many people. Gary Burton, who I used to play with, was the first one to use four mallets. And that changed how people play the vibes. Toots, in his way, really changed how people play the harmonica. Yeah, if you look back on that period, is there something in particular you, you learned from him? Um, uh, I wouldn't say anything in particular. I mean, I had been a sideman with a lot of great musicians. Uh, but. I, I think we really felt like a band, and I liked that. Um, he was very loose on the stage, and... Yeah, he easy making contact with the audience. Yeah, people loved him. I mean, how can you not love this guy, right? And, uh, you know, uh, I was part of a very big event in his life uh, when we played a concert at the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels. Uh, with me and Mark Johnson and Joey Barron, and that was the first time that he had really done a huge concert in that hall with an American group. With that, in that wonderful Horta Hall. Yeah, and just fantastic. And it it was released as an album, Nimikitz Pa. But I think that was I th that was a very big moment in his life. You know, I think he felt like he had really made it. You know, not that he hadn't before, but that was very important event for him, and I was glad to be part of it. Now, Mr. Hirsch, in the beginning of your career, you played with a lot of big names in the jazz when they were still there, like yeah. Stan Getz, Joe Henderson. Right. How was that? I learned something from all of them. Um, uh, from Joe Henderson, I learned about how to construct a long solo and, and how to be patient. Uh, and, uh, you know, f I played with him for almost 10 years, and we probably played the same 12 or 13 songs, you know, but every time he played them, he found something new. Not sometimes at first, it might take him a while to get to it, but um, we so used to songs, play it. At the, the songs are only vehicles to start an improvisation. Yeah, and, and uh, when we would play at the Village Vanguard, three songs would be one set. The songs were... The, were like the, 40 minutes. He, he, there were some very long, long tunes. And uh, from Stan Getz, I, I just, I learned about 
um, valuing uh, any new little bit of information or insight that you get uh, and really trying to apply it. You know, he was he was an incredibly melodic player. Can you give an example of that? Beautiful you mean a theory, or, or during a concert. Well, uh, one night I was a little depressed in the dressing room, and um, and he asked me what was going on, which was unusual. Stan was not could be a kind of a self-involved kind of person. He was complicated, and I I, I said, oh, I'm just I'm repeating myself. It's not so great, and. He said, well, did you play something differently tonight than you did last night? And I said, sure. He said, well, if you pay attention to that, and that happens, you know, once or twice a week, think of what you learn in a year. He said, you don't have to get out and reinvent the wheel every time you play. You just have to find something different, something that makes it alive in that moment. I thought he was really great at that. That's a life lesson. Eh? Yeah, it's a life lesson, exactly. Uh, Art Farmer, I played with many, many years. Uh, he, uh, I learned from him about developing repertoire. He had a really great book of very interesting material, uh, kind of obscure standards, uh, jazz compositions. Uh, he didn't play what other people played of his generation. He was always on the lookout for new material or interesting material. A and good reader. Yeah, he had just good taste in, in tunes. And he, he was the one who encouraged me to start writing tunes. And he recorded some of my early compositions. And he was very supportive in that way. Uh, yeah, and just in those days, we would play you know, every club in the, the U.S., you would play a full week. You'd play six nights or five nights. And now there are only a few clubs, like the Village Vanguard, where you play six nights in a row. It's just not, it's really changed. And if you went on the road, you would play a week in L.A., and then you'd play a week in Seattle, and then you'd play two weeks in Chicago, and then you, you know. And now it's, you know, just concerts or two nights here or one night there. It's very, very different. Um, a lot of traveling as well. Yeah, well, it was the great alto player Phil Woods said, I don't get paid to play, I get paid to travel. And that's exactly how I feel. You know, I'm just getting over jet lag here and, you know. You're doing uh, fine. Yes. By tomorrow night, uh, I'll be fine. But, you know, it, it takes... It takes a lot out of you. The older you get, it doesn't get any easier. That's tiring. That's so really yeah, and then just air travel is so terrible these days in every possible way. It just makes it a little. You have more anxiety about it. So yeah, of course. But I'm lucky to do what I do and yeah. and have the career that I have. When you when we read your book, uh, Mr. Hirsch, good things happen slowly we read that you were really eager in the beginning of your career to make it. And today, I mean, you really are a benchmark in modern jazz. Can I say that? How is it to look back now? Um, well, or are you happy now? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the title of the book, good things happen slowly. Uh, it applies to a particular quotation uh, from a doctor at a very dark time in my life. But, It also applies to the arc of my career. Um, I'm 63, you know. Uh, I was a little too old for the kind of the young lions uh, feeding frenzy in the 1980s. Uh, you know, it took me, I didn't make my own album until I was 30. Uh, but I've, I think... It's good to build up some maturity, right? Yeah, you know, you just keep keep doing what you're doing and try to get better and play with people you love and play music that you like and try to keep your hands working. And um, you had to face quite some medical adventures as well. Has yeah, that there's influenced been a, your vision on music as well. Yeah, there 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 are a lot of days where that 45 minutes or hour and 15 minutes that I'm on the stage, that's the best part of the day. I mean, just recently I had both of my hips replaced, this one just a month ago. And, uh, you know, it's it's not easy getting around. Uh, You're a brave man. Well, you know, uh, 
I, I hate canceling engagements, and because uh, uh, you know sometimes these concerts they take a year or two to develop, and then you hate to cancel them. So I try to do whatever I can to be sure that when the light goes up and the people are there, I'm, I'm ready to play. And can I say that when we see you play, that it's always getting better, always getting more intense? Is well, that also thank part you. of the I, game? I think, I, think I, I have gotten looser and also, at the, well, not just looser, but uh, I don't feel like I, I have to prove anything to anybody. Um, I have a very, I would say, distinct style, and I just stick with it, you know, and um, sometimes I hear different musicians and say, wow, I wish I could do that. You know, like, but on the other hand, they can't do what I do, so I feel like if I just stick to what I believe in, eventually good things will happen. And uh, I mean, and yes, it is, uh, it is, I do get a kick out of being, you know, thrown in the mix with the top piano players in the world. It is, it's very satisfying, but it's not why I do it. You know, the reason I do it is to communicate with people, to make them feel something. Uh, every time I sit down at the piano, I want to say, let's see what happens. No. How does uh, that work when you play a solo concert? You sit down at the piano and then you don't know what's going to. No, I don't really have next. a program. You know, I know there are a number of things that I might play, a number of ways that I might start the concert. Lately, I've been starting my concerts with something quiet uh, to just allow myself to kind of feel out the sound in the room and the piano and, and not do anything too technical. I mean, technically, yes, but not, you know, virtuoso kind of technique. And then, uh, and then it goes where it goes, you know, and sometimes a tune will come across my brain for some reason, and I've just learned, okay, maybe that's what you should play. Instead of saying, no, I shouldn't play that, I should play this. But then you're always wondering, well, what would have happened if I would have just listened to myself and played that? So, uh, yeah, I have a pretty big solo repertoire, and... Uh, Sometimes I enjoy kind of playing the same songs on a tour, and other times it's really mixed up. So it just depends on how I'm feeling, it depends on the piano. You've just won the Clara for Best International Jazz Album with your trio. Eh? Right. Tell us something about those guys. Wow, those guys. Together for a long time. Ten huh? years. This is our tenth year. Is it and true what they say? Like a piano trio, it's almost like a marriage? Yes, I think they say that about piano trios and string quartets, and you know, there's there is definitely a, a thing, um, and you know, it's everybody sort of has their role. I think uh, Eric McPherson, my wonderful drummer, he's a uh, he's got this great grasp of the tradition. I mean, impeccable. You know, and he can also play super open and creatively. Um, and he's kind of the problem solver. Uh, when we do a new tune, he he'll, he'll record the rehearsal and he'll record us playing it, and he'll try to find a way to play it that's his own. He wants to take ownership of the material uh, in his own way. Instead of playing a cliched kind of rhythm, he wants to find something special might be the choice of the uh, implement that he uses or the beat or something, but he likes to be specific. Yeah, so very much engaged in the tree. Yes, very much. And, and, and always plays to beautiful volume level, you know, never too loud. That's uh, also important because your style is really fluently. Uh, I can imagine uh, that the power drummer can be a problem. Sometimes. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't do power drummers. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Eric and and John Abair and I are all very attuned to just the physical sound that we get on our instruments. John is kind of the wild card. Um, he's very capable of playing something absolutely, you know, straight up, but he likes to kind of mix it up a lot. And do you give that freedom? I do give him that freedom. And I've, you know, I've had a number of trios, well, five real trios, 
Um, this one has lasted the longest. And I think a lot of it is because I give Eric and John the freedom to try stuff. Yeah, and it makes it more interesting for me. I don't want to control it. You know, if it's going somewhere that's interesting, that's engaging, that's great. You know, I don't have to be the decider about everything. So it doesn't have to be your show. You you want to be challenged in the tree. I want to be challenged, and I I I you know, uh, some tours will play the same program almost every night, and it it will be totally different. Other times we we almost never repeat songs. It really. Um, uh, and that the the concert at Flage, which became live in Europe, which has now gotten this yes. wonderful Clara Award, it's recorded uh, in Belgium. In Brussels. Was recorded, yes, in Brussels, and uh, very fitting. Um, Flage is a very special hall. The sound is wonderful. The sound and, is fantastic. And everyone who was on that stage knows that there is a very friendly ghost in there. Yes, very much so, and. Um, uh, uh, Rob Laurenthal had told me that they were going to record the concert, but I had forgotten. Which is good, maybe. Yeah, which is very good. And then uh, after that tour, we went into the studio in New York to try to make a trio album with this new material that we had been playing on the tour. And frankly, it was not very good. It was, I would not put it out. I decided that I just couldn't release it. It was not as good as our previous album, and I didn't feel strongly enough about it. And then a couple months later, I got a little depressed. And then a couple months later, I was talking with Rob, and, and I said, it's a shame that that concert at Flage wasn't recorded. He said, of course it was. I told you. Oh. And I said, well, can I hear it? And then the next day, they sent me the recording, and that became this album. So, uh, you know, I... And what do you particularly like about it yourself? Well, it really is live. I mean, the hall has a certain springiness to it. Um, I think it was I, maybe the last concert of the tour or close. Uh, I think all three of us were very inspired that night. Um, I, and I think it's as much... It's a real trio album. It's as much Eric and John as it is me. I mean, yes, it's my band, but I think the the way that both of them play on the album is is just fantastic. I agree. <laughs> yes, I think it's a really a really good, you know, and interesting. I think of the last eight albums I've made, seven have been live. And four, I didn't know were being recorded. So it seems Is to be the way that, to that? <laughs> it seems to be the way I'm going. You know, I don't love the studio quite so much anymore. You know, I like I like to capture the moment, really. Right. Uh, next year, I have a duo album with uh, Esperanza Spalding coming out, where she's just singing; she's not playing the bass. And uh, which we did at the Village Vanguard, and you can just feel the energy of the crowd. You know, it's just, it's kind of magic. Um, and uh, in the summer, I have a, a different sort of project that was done in the studio with the Vince Mendoza and the WDR Big Band. You will they be playing play. with that project at the uh, Yes, this summer. exactly. And they are just great. The band is fantastic. Vince is one of the absolute best arrangers working today, I think. Can you tell us something about it? So what well, can we expect? it's, it's uh, all my compositions, and it's a range of pieces from about 1983 to 2017. So, uh, the best of? Well, it's not a best of. It's just what we felt would be... The classics. Make a nice album for a jazz orchestra. And, and um, Some pieces are more fitted for that. Yeah, but thing. some things are very uh, open and free, and others are maybe a little more what you would expect from a big band. Um, there's some very strong soloists in the band. I don't even solo on every tune. Um, uh, they, they, they play with a lot of energy, precision, and Vince has been the one of the resident composers for 
that big band for maybe, I don't know, 30 years or something. So, so he, he knows, knows the band, each he knows player. the soloists, that's important. Yeah, and he knows about, you know, who is of the saxophonist who plays clarinet really well, or bass clarinet, or E-flat clarinet. or So there's all these beautiful doublings so in the So he woodwinds. writes with the musicians in mind. He really knows them so well, and that's such an advantage, uh, as opposed to just writing for a generic. And he's a real, he's a real orchestrator. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with that project. Uh, and, of course, it's something different, you know. And, and these days, you, each album needs to have some reason, you know, to be. Uh, in December, I released uh, an album that we call Trio 97, which was my second longest trio with Drew Gress and Tom Rainey. It was the Friday night of our my very first week as a band leader at the Village Vanguard. So that was an incredibly important moment for me in my career, something I'd always dreamed of. It took me until I was, you know, 41 to get there, but I got there. And uh, so the Friday night, we just recorded it just to have a document. And then I kind of discovered the these things and put them on. I said, well, we got a really great record so here. Special, yeah. So we put eight tracks out of that band, uh, which recorded two studio albums, but we never did a live album. So it's another side of a very important band in my career. And uh, Are there any other things on your bucket list left? Well, things on my bucket list, I don't know. I mean, I've, I mean, I seem to be putting out a couple of projects every year, uh, which is a lot. Um, Has your focus shifted like more towards composition through the years? I would say probably, well, with the WDR project coming out in June, and then the project with Esperanza coming out in maybe January, probably for the summer after next, the next thing I would probably do would be something that would feature original compositions but I'm not sure what or for whom or, but that's, I think that would be the next logical thing to do unless somebody records something at a gig and I love it. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, uh, Miles Davis recorded Green Dolphin Street many times. So I, I, I don't mind repeating, give, giving another recording of something I've already done because it's gonna be different. Anyway. And, and it's kind of fun to hear the difference between something that maybe I played 25 years ago and then re-recorded yeah. and see what the difference is. Can you, can you be uh, specific about that? What, what is different today? Oh, I, I, mean, there, I mean, there's songs that I've recorded three times over the course of my career, even four, um, on different albums with different instrumentation and uh, I, I don't think that every album has to be all new music. That's just, that's just where I've gotten. Uh, um, but I like to keep, you know, moving forward and I always, it's nice to know that there's a next thing and a next thing and hopefully the next thing after that. That's kind of my nature. Are you still teaching on the side as well? I teach only privately in New York and only very high level students who come to me they find me or you know i get a lot of emails oh you know my name is so and so and i'm from vienna and i'm going to be in new york for two weeks and can i get a lesson and and now if i before i say yes i say well can you send me some examples of your playing youtube clip or a sound file because before i I spend my time with somebody, I want to know what level they are because it's it's not about the money. It's about something that's... Oh, generosity. Yeah. yeah, and something where I feel like I can really be helpful. And if somebody is struggling with just basics, that's really not what I... They can work on that themselves. Yeah, there are many people who can teach them that. So, uh, But I'm not teaching in any institutions or conservatories. Do you have some kind of advice if there are students watching you now? Well, I think uh, something that I come across when I do master classes, uh, 
uh, around the world, um, uh, is I'm a little surprised at uh, how little the current crop of jazz students, how little they go deeply into the past in jazz. You know, uh, you know, piano players, they might go back to Bud Powell, but they won't go back any further. You know, they would rather listen to Brad Meldow. You know. um, and that's fine, but jazz language and rhythm is built on a foundation that goes back to, you know, 100 years. And, uh, and especially with the availability of streaming, Apple Music or Spotify or Everything whatever, is out there. you can have, you can listen to anything, really. You don't have to, like I did, go to the record store, you know, find the, you know, or buy a CD or, you know, you, you have it all available. And it's amazing that, that, that they just don't really listen to the jazz language and, and learn it um, in a deep way. And I, I think every young jazz musician now uh, wants to write, uh, play their own music with their own band. That seems to be what everybody is doing. But I would, I would encourage them to spend more time trying to interpret some repertoire that they didn't write, to try to find a way to make a standard or a jazz composition personal. Your own, yeah. Yeah, take ownership of it. Um, uh, when I learned to play jazz, there was no music on the bandstand. You had to learn all the songs by ear. Um, uh, you know, now I see you know multiple page complicated stuff all the time, and and um, you know not not with the best best I'm talking about, but with I, I, I do hear a fair amount of jazz kids playing music for other jazz kids. Um, but what I've learned going back to, from all the great artists that I apprenticed with is that you need to communicate. Um, nobody in the audience knows what's on your, what you wrote on that piece of paper. All they, all they know is, is it memorable? Does it make sense? Is the performer comfortable? Are they taking me somewhere? Am I feeling something? It doesn't matter the other stuff, that's algebra. You know, it's not music. So I, I, think, I think it's, you know, you need to have that balance of, of craft and emotion. Uh, and that's what gets people. So work on the craft, that's what I would say, and listen more. Thank you very much for oh, this conversation. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Mr. Hirsch. And thank you. Uh, congratulations with the Clara Award. Thank you. Thank you very much.